Well, I'm Harold Varmus, and very nice to be back uh, at UCSF for this occasion. Uh, and I want to thank Bruce for both uh, giving me a chance to participate and uh, for organizing what's proving to be an, an exceptionally interesting day, um, taking on topics that uh, are meaningful to Mike and to all of us who care about what science can do for humanity. Um, obviously, cancer has a special role in Mike's life because uh, it uh, is the science that he's focused on, and uh, this session um, uh, then has some special meaning, especially for me, having worked with Mike for so many years and uh, shared uh, the pleasures of, uh, of exciting discoveries. Now, the title of this session is uh, about metastasis. In fact, it's how to prevent metastasis, uh, a topic that we'll discuss in some detail. Uh, and I'm often um, chided with the notion that uh, even though we've worked on cancer, we've sort of been missing the point all these years that, uh, that, um, that Mike and I in particular and many of our colleagues are working on the problem of cancer in the, in the 70s and 80s were focused inappropriately on, on uh, primary cancers. Primary cancers don't kill you, people say. Uh, what kills you is metastasis, and why were you guys so stupid? Uh, <laughs> So let me just start by saying uh, that, uh, you know, there was a time when we were a lot younger uh, and, uh, and we did work on transformation because transformation is what you could work on uh, and we liked viruses that grew and that were found in chickens and mice and we liked working in cell culture uh, and uh, we were trying to understand how cancer began. Uh, but we weren't actually as stupid as people think. And we knew that metastasis kills people, but uh, it wasn't really very easy to study. And as you'll hear during the course of the next um, hour and a half, it's still difficult to study metastasis in human beings. It is possible uh, with a variety of new tools that have uh, grown up, especially in the 80s and early 90s, to try to understand metastasis in experimental animals, and you'll hear from our speakers and commentators about that. Um, but uh, um, th in those days, it seemed to me enough to understand how cancer got going. So uh, that will be one of the, the, ma the main topic of today's exercise. Uh, and uh, before I bring the first speaker to the podium, uh, first real speaker, uh, I'd like to say something um, about uh, about Mike's role here as chancellor. Now, um, I was gone the entire time that Mike's been chancellor, so uh, much of what I have to say is hearsay. Uh, my interaction with Mike as chancellor uh, was based on the perception that he was the hotel keeper of a very nice place on top of a hill where he and Catherine accommodated me on many occasions when I came to visit San Francisco for various reasons. So you know, he was the friendly, white-bearded, hotel keeper who seemed to be very loyal to the campus and uh, was very generous with his time and showed me where, uh, told me where the great art, me art exhibits and uh, were being held and occasionally took me down to, uh, to hear music. So I was able to get some um, reflected uh, uh, information about uh, what was going on in San Francisco and that was fine. But I knew from visiting uh, this part of San Francisco that great things were happening and um, uh, I knew that uh, he was the mastermind behind this really marvelous campus. At the same time, I knew that uh, having read his, uh, his uh, illuminating and, and uh, great, 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 wonderfully written book, that uh, this was not necessarily uh, a task that uh, he took on with in, in complete equanimity, uh, as you can read by uh, looking at this quotation lifted from his book, uh, which uh, points out that uh, those who take on these tasks uh, uh, um, which are not all that dissimilar from some I was taking on myself, uh, could be the cause of derision uh, in uh, the community of one's friends. Um, but in thinking about what was actually accomplished and just looking at it today, you realize what a, what a wonderful set of uh, things was accomplished. And one thing that was not on uh, Sue Hellman's list this morning was the transformation of cancer research on, uh, at this institution. When Mike and I were attempting to understand uh, the initiation of cancer, uh, we felt pretty lonely. That is, there wasn't a lot of what you'd call cancer research on this campus. There was a so-called Cancer Research Institute, and there were some people there who didn't just 
work on uh, things that were related to cancer, actually worked on cancer, but it was not a very vibrant effort. Uh, effort. It was not endorsed by a National Cancer Institute a designated cancer center, uh, and the cancer-related troops were pretty disparate. But I've learned uh, from um, observation and talking to people who are in the cancer research enterprise on this ca on the, in this institution, I hesitate to say on this campus because there are lots of campuses, but, uh, but there are many ways in which cancer research has profoundly changed. One is that uh, shortly after Mike became chancellor, uh, and in, at least in part as a result of, of his efforts, this became a comprehensive cancer center designated by the NCI. Uh, the cancer research community has enlarged with a lot of additional faculty, many of whom uh, were trained in Mike's lab, uh, and Mike played a very active role in trying to recruit those individuals to, uh, the, to various departments that contributed to the sense that this was a major cancer center. Uh, he was very, very um, adept at fundraising, actually seemed to enjoy it, and, uh, and uh, was uh, enormously uh, popular with donors. And uh, one of the great gifts that uh, he was able to raise was a $150 million anonymous gift. He probably knows who, who the donor was, but the rest <laughs> of us don't. Uh, the donor probably knows, unless Mike lifted it out of his pocket. Uh, and uh, a half of that large donation is now an endowment for cancer research in this campus, and I can tell you that uh, that is a very useful sort of money. Um, uh, cancer research is now going to be featured at Mission Bay. The uh, cancer center was somewhat isolated over at Mount Zion. It's great to have uh, many of the investigators down here doing uh, clinically oriented research and cheek by jowl with uh, the many basic scientists who are already here. And there will be cancer care in the new hospital that's eventually built at Mission Bay, creating even greater, a greater community of, uh, of, of investigators uh, interested in cancer across the spectrum of basic um, translational and clinical research. So this is a transformation much to be welcomed, and uh, uh, the, the, the notion of cancer research at UCSF is uh, obviously much more vibrant than it was before uh, Mike took over. And, uh, I'm sure that in the hands of a chancellor who already has dedicated a very large portion of her career to, to cancer research, um, Sue Hellman, that, uh, that this will continue to be a part of uh, the UCSF mission that thrives. So um, enough said by me. I'm just the moderator. Uh, let me turn things over now to the speaker and to commentators. And unlike previous chairman, I'm actually going to actually know who the commentators are and we'll say something about them. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we, be we begin with Juan Massaguet, who is our invited external speaker, uh, who um, is also is both a close colleague of mine and also officially my boss at Memorial Sloan Kettering because he's been the chair of the program in which my own lab has worked, the Cancer Biology Genetics Program. Juan Massaguet is a native of Barcelona. He's a Catalan. Uh, that gives him a certain character and temper that's interesting to work with. Uh, he um, uh, uh, spent uh, many years at the University of Massachusetts and then at Sloan Kettering working on the problem for which he's perhaps best known, that is the mechanism by which TGF-beta uh, sends signals to the cell uh, and uh, its many functions in, in uh, development and uh, disease. But uh, about uh, six or eight years ago, he started to take an interest in metastasis and has done uh, unbelievably brilliant work in trying to sort out some of the great problems of metastasis. Uh, I should say, perhaps before he gets underway, that, that, uh, that um, not only is metastasis clearly the problem that the cancer research needs to focus on in a major way now, but it presents some incredibly uh, uh, difficult problems, uh, many of which uh, Juan is already focusing on. First, what makes a cell endowed with metastatic properties? What are those properties? Are cancer cells endowed from the start with metastatic potential, or do they acquire uh, metastatic potential as a result of, of subsequent genetic or epigenetic events? What determines whether a cancer cell gets out of its primary site, gets into the bloodstream, goes to a distant site? What determines where it goes? What role does the microenvironment play? Other cells that are not cancer cells, what, do, what role do they play in guiding the, the destination and the proliferation of, of metastatic cells? Uh, why do some cancers show a long latency between primary disease and the appearance of metastasis, and others show very little? 
Uh, what is the diff inherent difference in those cancer cells or in the physiological response to cancer that determines whether or not latency can last up to 10 or 15 years or whether uh, cancers can be cured by, by uh, um, uh, uh, removing the primary cancer fully in, in the operating room. So these are all very profound questions, at the questions that raise issues about uh, prevention and treatment. Prevention will be a multi-layered concept here because what patients care about is not having metastatic disease. They don't mind if there are a few metastatic cells that never grow beyond a very small nidus. What can we do to detect cancer, cancers in a metastatic state earlier, and what would we do if we found them? Now, these questions are going to be on the agenda for, for cancer biologists working on a variety of cancers for a very long time. So without further ado, uh, Joan Massaguet, and then I'll come back to introduce the other speakers. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to be here. First and foremost, this is an occasion to celebrate Mike's uh, um, tenure as a distinguished uh, member and leader of this community, but this is also a celebration, at least for those of us coming uh, from the outside, a celebration of you as a community, UCSF, uh, a place where wonderful science um, happens. Uh, how to use the word thrive, this is, I think, a vast understatement. Um, I can help but smile, uh, smile uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at, at rem uh, remembering my first uh, meeting with Mike. Um, Mike, you may or may not remember, this was back in the early 80s, mid-80s perhaps, at a godforsaken place called Santander at a summer school where you kindly uh, accepted to, to come and attend. And I smile because at that time uh, I was in the fringes of cancer research. Uh, certainly cancer research, as it was understood then, the time of the... Uh, uh, oncogenes, uh, their discovery, and uh, the all-important role uh, of those genes and the proteins that they encoded in the transformation process of cells. I was working on that then obscured object called TGF beta, something that was certainly obscure enough to be dismissed by essentially the vast majority of molecular oncologists. TGF beta and its pathway was uh, eventually promoted to being uh, from obscure and to be dismissed to be totally annoying and to be avoided because of its multi-functionality uh, by most, but not by all, among them Mike. And this is because Mike is uh, above all a cell biologist, if I may uh, say so, and uh, that uh, he shares with uh, me and of course with many others. I sense that he appreciated all along the uh, value that uh, those uh, studies had uh, the possible implication and uh, significance in cancer research, something that time eventually um, uh, certified with many people placing TGF beta in the midst of uh, tumor microenvironment interactions and so forth. At that time, however, as Harold mentioned, it was my turn to turn the attention, and I turn it, uh, as Harold uh, just said, uh, to the problem of, of TGF beta. I ask many of the long list of questions that Harold has just mentioned. Now, let me tell you about the few that I have begun to answer. This is the um, biologist view of metastasis. You've seen versions of this carto cartoon many, many times. Um, it envisions and it, uh, in fact, reflects the reality that metastasis is initiated really at the time when uh, an incipient con con constraint contained tumor uh, invades its periphery, attracts stromal components, including components of neovasculature, and in so doing, it uh, paves the way for cells from this tumor to escape. Local invasion uh, and metastasis is, is almost uh, a, a made phrase, and it's the title of many grand symposiums, invasion and metastasis. And the focus has been largely here because, of course, out of these come cells that pass into the circulation. We know by the millions, and now we fully appreciate that this happens from the very beginning when the tumor is still in the very early stages, uh, vastly uh, before it was uh, in time before it is diagnosed. Uh, this tumor is already releasing cells that will circulate through the organism, some of which 
a minority of which, very few of which, will be able to survive not only the circulation, but manage this step, which is to escape through the um, vascular walls, the endothelial layers that separate uh, them from uh, organ parenchymas, barriers that will differ depending on the organ type, the sinusoids, fenestrated sinusoids in the bone marrow, probably easier, much easier to trespass by these cells than, say, the blood-brain barrier, and the lung would be somewhere in between. And then these cells will do micrometastasis and then big metastasis, and that is what happens. And because of that, uh, a lot of interest has been placed on uh, studying uh, the components of this, of this theater here uh, and the events that the cancer cell, uh, as well as these components, the stromal and otherwise, undertake from EMT to secretion of proteases, cytokines, TGFs, you name it. However, the patient and the oncologist's perspective on metastasis is different. It's very different because they begin to pay attention to their concern about this after the patient is rolled out of the OR and the surgeon has done this. And to this patient and to his or her oncologist, metastasis is what's left, disseminated, as of that point, and what this population of cells uh, 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 may go on to, to, to produce. Uh, there is almost complete certainty now that a tumor will have released cells and that these cells by the hundreds, by the thousands, maybe more, even though they are but a small fraction of what the tumor release, are there. Are there and sooner or later some of them may go on to pass, to graduate from mere survivors or adaptees to, uh, to uh, overtake the host microenvironment to seed and reseed themselves to the same type of tissue, to other tissues, until achieving lethal dissemination. So this is one of the aspects that intrigued me and my colleagues and many others, of course, the most that while it's okay to understand the biology of the early events, we really need to uh, drive attention, direct attention, to the biology of disseminated disease, understand how the cells survive, how the cells don't die, and how the cells eventually take off. Now, to do this, one has to keep on paying attention to uh, what the course of the disease is. While many of the aspects of early stage metastases in the primary, as, as they happen in the primary tumor, are applied universally to any tumor type, one really has to pay attention uh, to uh, the course of the disease, as I said, when one deals with uh, what may happen later. We have, for example, the case of, that is represented by breast cancer. Breast Adenocarcinoma is uh, one of those cases in which multiple organs may be involved, organs that are very different from each other as sites of distant metastasis. It is also a disease where there can be months, years, even decades between the diagnosis and removal of the primary tumor and the explosive outgrowth of metastasis. What does that mean? Well, it must mean that, of course, cells leaving the primary tumor uh, where a fraction of those cells competent to infiltrate at least one, possibly several of these organs, one initially, maybe seeding later the others. They are competent to infiltrate, in addition to being transform transformed, in addition to being angiogenic, etc., to being all those things that they have to be to generate the primary tumor, they have to be able to penetrate and they have to be able to sit tight and survive. What they are not able to do yet is to overtake to colonize. This is an ability that they will develop somehow by adaptation, by evolution, uh, probably by a mix, uh, while they're sit in the host microenvironment. That period of sitting, which is years to decades, is referred to as dormant metastasis or the latency phase of metastasis. Because they develop this, this, this ability to colonize during this period in a particular site, one may look at this as a, a process akin to uh, uh, Darwin's uh, finches on the Galapago Islands. Every island, in, in this case every organ type, will favor the emergence of certain clones that are competent proficient at manipulating and uh, uh, dominating the microenvironment. For example, in the bone, in the bone marrow, these cells uh, will prevail as metastatic entities, as osteolytic metastatic entities, if and only if they are able to rally the local osteoclasts to uh, dissolve bone. 
through the production of phosphocrystogenic factors that one can go on to identify and discover and maybe target. Now, coming up with these functions would not do these cells any good if they were sitting in the, in the lung and so forth in the brain. That led us to propose the uh, metastatic speciation hypothesis, again by an analogy to the finches. While this has served us and may have some merit, it doesn't quite apply to other cases, or at least not to the same degree, to other cases represented here by lung cancer, lung adenocarcinoma to be on another major uh, tumor type. Here, characteristically, uh, the tumors go on to disseminate and to dis disseminate to multiple organs, uh, the same ones more or less as breast cancer does, but quite swiftly. They wish these patient populations, they would have years to perhaps decades of, um, of uh, uh, detectable, uh, uh, free of detectable disease. Now here, something is happening to a subpopulation of these cells in the primary tumor that endows them with the competence to not only infiltrate, but to colonize, to be adaptive enough and resilient enough, they don't fall into a uh, sopor or in, uh, are forced into quiescence. Uh, on arrival, they can go on and within uh, a short period uh, prove lethal. How do we begin to exploit this biology uh, to identify what are the basis, the basis for these various functions? Here's an example of uh, one approach that we have taken uh, that uh, targets the first kind of questions. How do cells evolve uh, different functions when one is dealing with a case like breast cancer metastasis that is metastatic typically to multiple sites? And um, how would one identify the genes that uh, support these functions? The approach taken in this case is to go and uh, obtain representatives of these various species and interrogate them for what they express, what they have that makes them unique, and with that may do archaeology to find out what is that allowed them to do this, as well as to infiltrate years ago uh, that site. This is something that can be done by uh, scrutinizing uh, cells that I have from a patient with advanced disease in the form of cell lines that I have from that stage from the pleural fluid, which is clinically available. It has to be drained because these patients with advanced breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, cannot breathe. Uh, or primary cultures directly from these patients, uh, as we've done. They can be labeled, these cells. They can be introduced into a mouse and asked whether the mouse would sort these cells based on this hypothetical uh, uh, presence of different species that represent the different sites where these cells uh, thrived, expanded, and eventually came out from, mingled in the circulation and the body fluids of that patient. And indeed, this experiment works, and works very well, to the point that one can uh, isolate, uh, as you can see here, bone metastatic, brain metastatic, uh, and lung metastatic cells, separate them from each other, explant them in vitro, cultivate them, shoot them into the next round of mice, and find that what you picked from the brain of the first mouse predominantly will go now to the brain go and nest, develop metastasis to the brain of uh, subsequent mice injected, lung to lung, bone to bone. And also another important set of experiments demonstrate that these cells were already present here. It's not something that evolved in the mouse. It had evolved in the human. And indeed, with these, one can begin to exploit the system, compare these cells by gene expression profiling, microRNA expression profiling, whatever you would like profiling and begin to find associations between uh, what's expressed and the phenotype. For example, let's take the lung uh, metastatic phenotype. A gene, uh, a set of genes, 54, that make the cut in the experiments that we did. I'm sure that done with another sample with another patient, the cut will be somewhat different, although we know now uh, uh, substantially overlapping. Uh, this is the list of genes that are candidates uh, for any one of the functions that are important for these cells to do this, which is the screen that we subjected them to. Uh, inoculate them into the bloodstream of the, of, the, of, the, of the mouse and ask them to do this, to enter the lung and to colonize aggressively. And we went on to find that of, this, uh, of these various genes, some of them reflected functions that these cells were carrying were carrying with them already from the time that they had emerged the primary tumor. At least this is the inference because some of these genes were found to be expressed in primary tumors when we scrutinized hundreds of primary tumors from patients. In a subset of patients, 
these genes are expressed at least this profile of genes is expressed, and it's expressed in a manner that in these patients is associated with an increased incidence of long relapse years later. That is because these genes are engaged in the primary tumor, uh, perhaps as already enhances of the performance of these cells in the primary tumor. We went on to find that of these genes, some uh, are uh, enhancers of the assembly of uh, 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 neovasculature, not in the proliferation or recruitment of, uh, of pedicides and endothelial cells, but on the assembly, the coverage of nascent vessels with, uh, with, uh, with pedicides. Well, it so happens that cells that are expressing, cancer cells that are expressing these genes appear regularly in a, an, I, an EGF receptor ligand, COX-2, prostaglandin, uh, synthesizing enzymes, and the collagenase MMP1. Uh, these cells are, by virtue of doing these, which they are doing for their own purposes here, are endowed with the ability uh, to have an advantage, a higher probability of penetrating the, uh, through the lung capillaries. Uh, through functions perhaps related to the ones used here, but different, because here is the name of the game is about trespassing these tight layer of endothelium, not making vessels. That's something that they may do later, but uh, this is the first demand that they are exposed to, pass or else, and then get, they get to pass. Now, it's not that all of the genes that one finds expressed in this manner represent uh, a, an advantage uh, and a purpose in the primary tumor. Take, for example, antipoietin like 4, also of that list. The presence of this gene expressed at high levels in primary tumors reflects, as it turns out, the presence in the microenvironment of these tumors of a cytokine of a strife, TGF-beta cytokine, that is produced by many sources, including the cancer cells themselves, but principally myeloid progenitors and others that uh, concur on the tumor because they sense a strife and they try to do something about it, and TGF-beta is a tool for that. Well, these cancer cells, which have dismissed the growth inhibitory responsiveness to TGA beta, still retain TGA beta receptors and SMATs and mm -hmm. whatnot, and can activate many of the classical, typical SMAT dependent TGA beta responses, uh, including one that it so happens uh, as they uh, travel out of the tumor minutes, uh, fractions of an hour after having sensed TGA beta, and they find themselves lodging into the, those lung capillaries. Uh, this uh, gene product, angiopoietin like force, secreted by the cells that were seeing TGA beta just moments ago, helps them also increase the probability of trespassing because what angiopoietin like for does to uh, tight endothelial layers to blow away cell cell junctions, with that again increasing around the cell the chances of passage. And this is how uh, patients whose primary tumor uh, contains or expresses scores positive for the long metastasis signature, as well as a TGA beta response signature, are the ones that combine to, be, uh, to contain the highest probability of uh, long uh, relapse. And this is looking at ER negative uh, 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 primary tumors, not patients, primary tumors, which uh, as a whole already represent um, a higher uh, risk of uh, long relapse. So uh, these approaches have uh, allowed one to do this archaeology by scrutinizing what these cells have that allow them uh, to uh, thrive there uh, and lead to the finding of genes that early on in that day when that's, that cell came out of the tumor uh, already enhanced the probability in a way that materialized with higher load of cells in that particular organ. The same approach can, one, can lead one to identify uh, genes that are important in that ultimate phase, the explosive growth, the taking over of, the, uh, of, the, of that particular organ, tissue microenvironment. This is the case most uh, clearly uh, in, uh, of, of the studies, of the results of the studies on the bone metastasis process. Here, uh, there is in fact little to be found that is associated with, this, with the ability of these cells to infiltrate. These may reflect perhaps the fact that these capillaries are fenestrated, as I mentioned, and so the barrier to infiltration is not so high. Regardless of whether these cells arrive expressing these pro-infiltrative abilities that serve them in the lung, also as we went on to find in the brain, um, that 
they do not make uh, much of a difference because the, 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 this is not so really limiting here. What does the score are other genes uh, uh, rarely, if, if at all, expressed in the primary tumor because these are gene expression events that uh, are selected for in this context where the important process of engaging osteoclasts through the agency of uh, osteoblasts and the production of run ligand and other factors is uh, stimulated by a number of cytokines directly or indirectly as well as proteases that process these cytokines produced by the tumor cells engaging in deeper biology that if you have the inclination can go on to study that involves such things as a vicious cycle proposed by Me Greg, Go Greg Mondi many years ago that involves uh, uh, factors prominently TGF beta released from bone matrix as well as IGFs that act on the cancer cells to further stimulate the expression of some of these very uh, metastatic genes, interleukin-11 CTGF being targets of TGF beta action in this context. Well, the progress achieved in the example of our own lab, but many others could be and are being uh, are joining in this effort. Uh, in the case of my lab, this is a cartoon that exemplifies again, uh, some of the progress achieved. Uh, labels placed along this path for infiltration of the lung, for infiltration uh, of the brain, for colonization uh, of the bone, and of course, deeper analysis of any one and each of these genes in the context can lead to uh, lovely biology, biological insights into how and why this particular gene or its product is serving a particular step in the metastatic progression of these cells. What this approach um, had not uh, yielded yet was answers to questions that matter a lot. For example, the question of what supports the long-term survival of disseminated cancer cells after they arrive, survival on arrival, when they are exposed to the shock of an environment that they had never seen, the lung, the bone marrow, the brain. How do they cope? How do they survive? How do they adapt? Do they mimic that, that microenvironment? We know that the vast majority of them die. So the undead, how do they manage? Or in the other case, uh, lung adenocarcinoma, what, what of the functions that allow these cells to, 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 uh, to perform this swift multi-organ metastasis process in which one doesn't seem uh, to, to find a lot of uh, organ uh, speciation? These cells do not need to speciate. They don't have a chance, uh, and they don't need to because they are like albatrosses. They can thrive on any island. For this, we've taken another approach that has proven, it's beginning to prove fruitful. And that approach is to, in instead of interrogating the end products and do archaeology, we interrogate primary tumors for, the li for links between elements of, these, uh, of the molecular makeup of these tumors and the phenotype of interest. For example, to explain this, we would like to find in primary tumors activation of elements, genes, pathways, that are associated with, uh, with the group of patients, the group of tumors um, that express this, with, in these patients, the emergence of very late onset metastasis. Late onset metastasis implies, demonstrates, the ability to survive for a long term. So that was how we formulated this question, um, um, Xi'an Zhang in the lab. What might be associated in the primary tumor with the ability of uh, uh, in breast cancer to uh, relapse and relapse very late in the case of bone to uh, narrow the search? The way this was done was not by, again, scrutinizing the entire genome wide of gene expression events, but by looking for something else more directed. If we are looking, if we are talking about survival functions, well, we do know by now about many pathways that have been implicated in one setting or, or on another, sometimes in most settings, with survival functions, anti-apoptotic functions. So why instead of uh, scrutinizing just the entire gene expression profile or do uh, genomic analysis uh, of these tumors, why don't we uh, more deliberately ask whether any of a number of pathways that are associated with survival functions might be uh, uh, linked to this particular survival function, long-term survival leading, uh, uh, leading to late-onset metastasis.
For this, the approach was to uh, derive gene expression signatures that are representative of uh, or that describe, denote the uh, presence of an activated TGA beta pathway or wind pathway or MIG pathway or RAS pathway or SARC pathway. Interrogate primary tumors and again look for that association that I'm mentioning. When we did that with these six initial pathways, and this of course could be done by, with another dozen, and it would be, I think, important and useful to do it uh, with another dozen, but with these six there was a clear winner. And that was not uh, um, just because I was going to be here today talking in honor of Mike and his colleagues who uh, had uh, something to do with uh, SARC as an oncogene, but one and only one, a pathway that represents the notes activity of SARC and everything that depends on SARC. We are going to see what depends on SARC, high level of SARC performance in the cells, was associated with the phenotype of interest. And the phenotype, again, I repeat, is uh, the emergence of bone metastasis uh, abundantly and especially late after a long time after diagnosis. This is looking at uh, 368 primary breast tumors. The ones that score negative, low to declare negative, because they have low levels of this gene ensemble that denotes somehow SARC activity in the cells, have cases of um, bone metastasis. But you see what's going on. By three years, if they haven't done it, that's it. It's over. These cells, if they are there, they are unable to proceed. And maybe there are no tumors because these cells have by then disappeared. The ones that are score positive not only are more robust, but they can go on for many years. What tumors are uh, uh, SARC signature positive? Well, 90% of estrogen receptor positive tumors are. There is literature indicating associations, biochemical associations, and functional interactions between ER and SARC non leading to non-transcriptional effects on the cell. 50%, roughly, although this is uh, more a continuous, a continuous uh, in the case of HER2-positive tumors, are also scoring a SARC positive, and we, are not, we know, of course, through the work of others, of interactions between HER2, uh, HER3, and uh, SARC mutually potentiating signaling functions, as well as 25% of triple negative tumors. The reason for uh, the basis for this activity is currently under investigation with interesting results that I will share with you some other day. But this uh, analogy led us to ask whether this link, this uh, association, led us to ask whether um, indeed SARC has a function in ensuring resilience of the cells in the context of the bone marrow. This is one of the experiments that illustrated that this is the, this is the case. This is using cells from a patient that are isolated through selection in the mouse for growth in the bone, but they are very indolent. They will give more bone metastasis, but after many months. Not like the rapidly, aggressively growing uh, MDA 231 cells and others. So this is not exactly a model of dormancy, but it's an approximation to, uh, to dormancy, or at least latency, long, sluggish uh, outgrowth in the bone that requires, however, ability to survive. You are looking at the experiment as I'm talking, basically inoculate the cells. After a while, luciferase, expressed in these cells is not increasing, is continuing to be barely detectable, flush the marrow, and by QRT-PCR or for human, uh, for human uh, gene expression, uh, hum expression of human genes uh, in the marrow, in the flush marrow population, or more cleanly by uh, selection in puromycin for uh, growth of uh, inoculated cell colonies, count. And one finds that indeed these cells, which were not taking off, were nonetheless uh, uh, present there. If the cells going in are deprived of SARC by knockdown with a, a short hairpin RNA, that cuts this presence by a factor of tenfold. The reason why these cells are not doing well in these and other models is because, not because they cannot get there, they get there they succumb more briskly if they are deprived of SARC activity. Uh, the SARC RNAi, SARC uh, short hairpin knockdown shows uh, these cells, in this case in another model, allowed to 
column uh, in the bone marrow, they will show many more uh, figures of uh, tunnel positive cells than the controls or the cell rescue. As will cells, um, cells in mice where the mouse is uh, administered, treated with a SARC inhibitor, the satinib. Why and how SARC may be providing this function to these cells, this survival function? For this, we decided to scrutinize what's in the bone marrow microenvironment, because this is where these cells are thriving. Maybe SARC is endowing these cells with a superior ability to profit, to benefit from that otherwise very challenging microenvironment. When we scrutinize the microenvironment of bone metastasis from the uh, collection in the, in, the, in the pathology department at Sloan Kettering, for the expression of genes, especially those that would be the top candidates, secreted products uh, in the bone microenvironment, the bone marrow microenvironment, 17 were uniquely associated with bone metastases, not so prominent in metastases to other sites. And it's bone metastases where this phenotype of uh, superior survival was associated with SARC. Of these, several are highlighted because they are the ones that eventually provided the answer. IGFs and CXCL12, also known as SDF1, on the one hand, and the killer cytokine trail on the other, where are the answers? Where are the answers because the biochemical analysis of, uh, of, of what these cells end up with SARC are capable of doing when exposed to these, uh, these cytokines is that uh, they have a superior ability to respond to these cytokines through their corresponding receptors with activation of AKT PI3 kinase survival pathway and perhaps other functions as well. But when looking, we did find these to be very prominent. And at the same time, SARC somehow uh, suppresses, uh, blunts the ability of trail V8 zone receptors to uh, compromise, compromise survival. So these are some of the insights that on first pass one can extract from the approaches that I'm sharing with you. This leads in turn to suggestions. For example, we would propose to consider the use of SARC inhibitors against disseminated tumor cells to prevent metastasis, to treat uh, the disseminated population that is totally asymptomatic, but that is cause of, for great concern in the patient and in the oncology, is treat with something that will pull the plug on pathways that are much more critical for the survival, the sustenance of these cells than they would be of the descendants of these cells once these cells have already engaged in explosive metastatic outgrowth uh, uh, years later. Um, the preliminary analysis shows that indeed this, uh, this is feasible, at least at the level of the model. Uh, one of these inhibitors available uh, in fact, in clinical use, uh, this is what is administered to patients who fail on Gleevec, CML patients who fail on Gleevec. The satinib is a dual uh, BCR able and SARC inhibitor. Uh, so we know about its toxicities and about its limitations, but also about its great use for CML patients. Well, the satinib will indeed prevent uh, the survival, uh, activation of survival pathways in breast cancer cells uh, when these cells are allowed the benefit of CXCL12 uh, or uh, IGF1. And in uh, the mouse setting, indeed, if the satinib is uh, administered before these cells are allowed to take hold of the bone, this is a very aggressive model of bone metastasis, the satinib will blunt uh, profoundly the ability of these cells to take off later. If one waits, if the cells have begun to develop colonies, then it's too late. It's, they are too robust, they don't mind having access to these factors, but they don't need them um, uh, as essential functions. This is the more indolent um, uh, model. This is, again, preliminary, but it's all going in the same direction. These cells are liable to disappear, to perish, if exposed, deprived to, uh, of, uh, of SARC function, and the more robust AKT activation in response to bone microenvironment signals by a pharmacological or uh, uh, RNAi treatment. So this is the concept. That uh, the concept is that I want to impress you with is that it is possible. 
but uh, to scrutinize that which has really never been uh, investigated in metastasis research. It has been directed to those early stages in primary tumor dissemination. It has been directed metastasis research to the bone metastatic osteolytic processes when, when metastasis is already avert. But the time in between, people have not approached that because it's a great concern, it's difficult, it's especially challenging. But we believe it can be done. It can be done not only to the point that one can find and understand some of the biology, but one can even develop ideas that can be placed in the hands of clinicians now for them to do whatever they uh, uh, would find it uh, uh, meritorious to do with these ideas. Finally, let me leave you with a notion that metastasis uh, is not quite like the cartoon depicts it, where you have ball, tumor, tube, bloodstream, ball, metastatic tumor, but this is an incredibly dy dynamic process. We now fully appreciate through uh, techniques that have allowed the identification, quantification, and beginning to uh, allow the scrutiny of circulating tumor cells and of disseminating tumor cells that um, the period before explosive outgrowth of, of metastasis is not a, a period of absolute quiescence where these cells are doing nothing. These cells move, they are moving in and out of bone marrow and perhaps other tissues, and they circulate, they may seek and find better niches for the survival, for their expansion. Let me share to end uh, a process that we have recently observed uh, coming from uh, theoretical considerations with a colleague, Larry Norton, who is a clinician at Sloan Kettering, and with this I want to highlight the uh, tremendous importance of interacting, uh, not only technologically with tissue samples and, and gene expression data sets, but conceptually and intellectually with uh, clinical investigators. Well, with them, we wondered whether what would happen if, if these cells that have such a hard time so many barriers to implant themselves in distant organs, uh, the ones that keep on circulating because they didn't get stuck in the lung on the first pass, or perhaps the ones that did enter a, a distant organ and came out of it again, and while they were sitting there, they were in this very precarious uh, uh, state, precarious or at least not a state of overt growth. What would happen when these cells uh, continue to circulate and pass through the primary tumor? Wouldn't they recognize that, a homey environment where they would easily extravasate, those are leaky capillaries, and they would find the stroma that they were accustomed to, in fact, the stroma that they and their uh, siblings produced? And if so, what consequences might this, might this have? Well, one experiments with this idea in mind are done. You see this process which we call tumor self-seeding, left and right. We've seen it with, with breast cancer models and, and, and melanoma and, and colon cancer models, xenografts uh, in mice. Uh, in this modality, one mass of the same tumor is placed in different, in different mammary glands, one labeled with, with GFP, the other not. You wait, and whereas these cells would never seed uh, a, uh, an intact mammary gland, they very avidly seed uh, the green cells, the tumor on the other side. Or in this case, we had green on one, uh, GFP on one, and red fluorescent protein on the other. And you can see the cedars in green in the sea of recipient uh, tumor uh, populations, and the black presumably, or dark, is presumably stromal components. Again, uh, these are two masses of the same tumor. So it is really the same tumor distributed to, in order to visualize the experiment into different mammary glands. The point is then that these tumors release cells into the circulation. Some of these cells will find their way back. Here's uh, uh, some uh, images of, of this phenomenon. This is a cedar tumor. You see a number of things. You see that the cedar population is never dominant. But when you scrutinize this population, when you re-isolate it, and you ask, what are these? You realize that this process of self-seeding has collected from the bloodstream the best of the worst, the most aggressive, most metastatic entities that were part of that initial mixed population. Perhaps not surprising in hindsight that the ones that would resist and be able to infiltrate better a tumor are also the ones that have already these advantages with regards to uh, metastasis of different organs. A tumor that is forced to be seeded is a tumor that grows better. 
Again, not because these cells are fast growers, they fast, the cedars are uh, as uh, 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 remain a minority, they don't take cover, but the cedars being more aggressive do all those things that we know cancer cells, aggressive cancer cells do. They release factors that enhance angiogenesis. This is a, a, a force seeded tumor, more uh, vasculature, that uh, recruit macrophages, myeloid cells, neutrophils, and all of those things that are good for tumor growth. And this is how tumors that are force seeded are, are, um, are, are, can be shown to grow faster. With this, one can, as a cell biologist now, a biochemist, can go on to scrutinize what brings these cells here. Again, how many of you have done metastasis assays hoping to see, because your paper, your thesis defense, depends on it, hoping to see invasion of cells into the lungs, the bones, the brain, but you never see these cells seeding a mammary gland. You implant a tumor in a mammary gland, and they will go there like a bandit. So the tumor is pulling them in, the cells are wanting to go in, and once they go in, they do all of these things. We have looked for and found the pool factors, interleukin-6 and interleukin-8, emerge in these models as important mediators uh, of the tumor attraction of the circulating cells. We found also functions that allow these cells to go in. The uh, uh, invadopodia uh, 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 acting cytoskeletal, cytoskeleton um, a bundling protein, FASIN1, uh, emerges prominently in that setting and factors that allow the cells, once they are in, to do all this, uh, CXL1 uh, and 2 uh, among, among them. This is something that you may say, well, that's interesting, but so what? This tumor in a patient is a still a tumor that would go out. And absolutely, this is absolutely right. However, with don't think that this may be the end of it. We are concerned about this possibility, which we are now studying, in fact, in, par, uh, uh, in collaboration with Harold. What if a post-tumor stroma that is inflamed, that has those cytokines, that has a stroma of the same kind where the tumor used to uh, uh, leave, uh, can act as a recipient for cells that are emerging from disseminated states and go there to nest? to expand the clone, not necessarily to see it re local relapse, but to get a breather, to expand, to relaunch, to distribute, and in this process to uh, enrich that patient's uh, uh, body with, again, more of the best of the worst. Keep in mind the well-known clinical fact that soon after surgery, surgical removal of a tumor, there is a burst of metastasis uh, up, to date, uh, up to this date uh, unexplained. Anyway, these are some of the vignettes that I wanted to share with you. It is possible to interrogate. It is possible to begin to um, uh, find answers, um, including answers perhaps to this question. My own take on this is uh, that it's very important to understand the biology of disseminated disease, perhaps with the advent of technologies to uh, scrutinize disseminated tumor cells and circulating tumor cells, and to target those functions that allow this disease to exist. Something that, of course, it has been done classically with uh, chemotherapy, although not rationalized that way, but it needs to be done better, cleaner, and more effectively. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Juan. Juan will join us on the podium at, at, on the, at the panel table in just a moment. We're now going to have two commentaries by people who are well known to this community, um, Mark, Mark Schumann and Zena Wuerr, both of whom have been members of the faculty here for, I think, over 30 years. Interestingly, they, they don't need extensive introductions, but they, I think it is worth pointing out the different perspectives they bring to a convergence of interest on metastasis. Uh, Zena, who's going to speak first, is a well-known cell biologist and developmental biologist who's been interested in development of the breast in particular and is focused on uh, components of the extracellular matrix and whose work is now um, uh, quite heavily focused on uh, determinants of, of metastatic growth, uh, some of which reside in the extracellular matrix. Mark, who is uh, a clinician by trade, uh, hematologist and oncologist, who when I first knew him was working on tyrosine phosphorylation as part of platelet development and has developed increasing interest in a number of aspects of clinical behavior of tumors. And I'll ask both of them to speak 
in less than 10 minutes, preferably something like five, and then everybody will, will join us at the table and we'll try to engage the audience in further discussion. Zena? Okay, I, I want to uh, thank Bruce for, uh, uh, I guess, uh, inviting me to, uh, to speak here, and I want to, uh, to honor Mike by uh, you know, telling you about some of the uh, questions that I think are important in the metastasis, but also um, I want to uh, credit him for being one of the people who got me really interested in metastasis and in cancer in general, because when I came here uh, to UCSF, cancer was the furthest thing from my mind. So it's the exciting environment uh, of this uh, uh, what I would call an aberration of development uh, that is cancer uh, that has you know, brought me here uh, finally today. Okay. So the first thing I want to mention to everyone is that cancer is actually a systemic disease. And if you want to understand metastasis, which is maybe the ultimate of it becoming systemic, going away from the primary tumor, I think it's important to, to realize that it's not the only aspect uh, you know, of cancer, the distant metastases. But there are many other changes that occur because you have a tumor growing, including immune defects, uh, blood clotting defects, mobilization of, of many cells to many places. And so in a way, what I've been uh, interested in and what I want to just sort of mention today is that as a kind of cellular ecologist, realizing that the ecology of the whole organism has changed, maybe that may be the clue to metastasis because metastasis occurs in virtually every kind of cancer and it occurs even when tumors are very small. Uh, if, in fact, 7% of all human cancers are metastasis of unknown primary, so that the cells want to go uh, walk about rather than grow locally. And it's this, this uh, looking at what is the environment uh, that is occurring in the body as a whole uh, that is really the, the key to, uh, I think, the, the basic questions. Why do cells want to start to move about in the first place? And why do they go to where they're going? And here in this movie, you'll be able to see from a primary tumor, cells are getting into the blood and washing away and then landing in the various uh, sites. And, uh, you know, using this kind of in vivo uh, imaging, we're able to see the beginnings of the metastasis. We're, at this point, not really that good at seeing the ends of, of this process, looking at the metastasis itself. But there's something very special about the, this, these areas where cells are getting into the bloodstream. And that's where the environment has changed a great deal. There's a change in the extracellular matrix. You can see here in this picture with the collagen. You're full of inflammatory cells here. So here's a tumor, here are many. Uh, it, here's the collagen, here are the inflammatory cells. Uh, they're at the margin of the tumor. And in fact, these margins have often been ignored because uh, pathologists usually study this part of the tumor. And if they go to the edges, they're looking to see where the tumor has uh, not gone. But what's very interesting is as you start to make movies of what's going on, this is live imaging in a mouse, uh, that in fact these green cells, which are the inflammatory cells, mostly myeloid, macrophage-like cells that have responded uh, to the tumor, that they are doing a lot more than the tumor cells themselves. And so it's this very rich area that is, has changed, that's responsible for the area in which you're going to have metastases. And then the question is, is that also happening in the areas to which you will get metastasis? And that seems now to be the case, because even before the first cells can get out of the tumor, because the tumor is a, um, an organismal disease, you already have recruitment of such cells and, and a change in the matrix you know, the so-called metastatic niches occurring. And that's where the cells are, when they land there, even though it's a rare event, one in 10,000, one in 100,000, maybe one in a million, will we'll eventually be able to grow. And so it's by 
<laughs> starting to appreciate the, 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 the yellow is uh, the bloodstream. There's a marker in it that's leaking out and being taken up by some cells. The green are the inflammatory cells. The blue are the tumor cells. And you can see that, again, there's this incredible activity where the tumor is growing. And, and at least in dead biology, this looks just like what uh, the area where the, uh, the tumors themselves um, uh, are growing as metastasis. So what are the big questions? So the questions are, why, uh, why do the cells want to get out in the first place? How, uh, what are the molecules that make this environment change even before tumor cells hit there? Why are cells able to sit there for many years? Is it because uh, they're unable to, to, to take off? Is it that the immune system is engaged and keeps it under control? Or are the normal cells in that environment able to normalize the cells well enough? And we know from many experiments with chimeric animals uh, that, uh, that cells that have many mutations are able to be fairly normal, whether they're of tumor origin or other norm uh, origin, when they're with cells that uh, have a normal differentiation. So, uh, with that, I think uh, those questions will, uh, I'll let Mark now speak. First, uh, I'd like to thank Bruce for inviting me to participate as a panelist. Uh, I consider it a great honor. And then um, I'd like to just briefly I give my perspective of Mike's importance in the development of cancer research at UCSF and cancer in general. Um, I first interacted with Mike and Bruce actually many decades ago. I have been here for over 30 years. This was my first faculty position. And Bruce and Mike started an elective course for medical students called the Biochemistry of Cancer. Um, and I participated as one of the co-leaders of that course. It grew to become a very popular elective, and other people, I believe, including Harold, uh, subsequently were involved in the teaching of that course. Also, um, uh, many years ago, uh, Mike was involved in a cancer club that Bruce and some others, including Harold, uh, initiated, and myself, um, that met once a month, 10 clinicians and 10 scientists. And it was a very open, free-ranging discussion. One time a clinical investigator would present interesting problems they're encountering. And I can remember one time Harold presenting before he left about Wnt and breast cancer. Uh, I think it really is an example how Mike has had an impact on translational cancer research at UCSF. And there are many other examples, but indeed uh, those are ones I was personally involved in. And another example of how Mike has had an impact on cancer research, translational cancer research, uh, a former postdoc of Mike's, Art Levinson, was CEO of Genentech for uh, many years, and especially during the period of uh, its greatest impact on cancer with the development of um, several new drugs that have been approved for cancer treatment along with our chancellor. So um, preventing metastasis. I joined the faculty in 1976 as an assistant professor, and it's now 2010, and I'm waiting. Um, and I'm very patient. I'm not complaining. I know this is a very difficult process. <laughs> oh, it's showing up on the screen. Oh, no, that's someone else's talk. <laughs> OK. The dirty secret is out. I'm terrible at audiovisual. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I guess it wasn't connected. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, that looks familiar. Okay. <laughs> okay, and this actually, I hadn't pre, had any pre-discussions with John about, uh, I know about his research, obviously, but I think perhaps we may be looking at the problem uh, perhaps in the slightly naive way. And what I'd like to suggest perhaps is that it's very difficult to actually prevent metastasis and that hypothetically, this is a hypothesis, in the patients who have metastases at presentation or who develop it subsequently already had metastasis and our technology is not good enough to detect that. So it may not be that we can really prevent metastasis. Uh, discussing uh, in terms of what Joanne had presented, it might be what we need to do is prevent those cells that have metastasizing, metastasized from growing and metastasizing themselves. So there's, there's some hints that this, in fact, may be the case. And we know through uh, accepted cancer staging, TNM refers to the tumor, the lymph nodes, and metastases. As one goes from early stage cancer, stage one, uh, which is organ confined, ah, well, it's pretty easy to, yeah, okay. This may take more than five minutes. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, who thought they had to rehearse a five-minute talk? Um, in stage one disease, there's better than, and this is a generalization for many common cancers, breast, prostate, lung, etc. Early stage disease, there's approximately 90% five-year survival. Yet, still, a small percentage of these patients die. Uh, even though they appear to be stage one, early stage, they're probably not, that 10%. Larger tumors, stage two, perhaps 60 to 70% will have a five-year survival, disease-free survival. And up to stage three, where there aren't demonstrable organ metastases, again, a generalization where there's regional spread, therefore it went outside the tumor, might be associated with lymph nodes, uh, or stroma outside the capsule, the five-year disease-free survival rate drops dramatically. And I would offer the hypothesis that what the problem is here, they really aren't all stage one or two or three. The ones who develop recurrent disease already had it when they presented, and we didn't de detect it. And then, of course, when they have gross metastases, we're talking about um, five-year disease-free sur survivals of less than 10%. So I'd like to restate the question. Can we more effectively extend survival of patients with micrometastases at presentation? And this, I think, again, didn't pre-rehearse with John, but I think he's really stating the same question. So uh, I'd like to, whoops. <laughs> I'd like to say that metastasis is rocket science, and it's a really difficult problem. And we, many people, not we, many people were very naive, are very naive, and expecting us to be able to prevent or cure metastases. Uh, it's very early days. And we need rocket scientists. So, um, we need better science and technology. And I'm not uh, catering to Harold's new term as head of the NCI, but I believe science is critically important for us to really make clinical advances. We really, really need to understand cancer biology. And uh, hopefully I'm not antagonizing anyone. I usually do, but I think we're really in the infancy of understanding cancer, the biology of cancer, let alone metastasis. There's so much more we need to understand, and I think the failure of many of our new therapies to do more than we had hoped is a reflection of our limited understanding. Scientific discovery leads to new targets, and we need new targets. We need to understand signaling pathways uh, the complexity of them to a much greater degree. And I'm um, 
really struck by the presentation by Professor Losek on B. subtilis, that there's still major complexities to that one-celled prokaryote that are not understood, that are ripe for scientific discovery. So we're talking about a simple, I don't mean that offensively, we're talking about a <laughs> prokaryotic cell that we're still struggling to understand some of the basic processes versus a cancer, which is, which is a heterogeneous population of cells, many of which have different mutations and amplifications. And we need to understand new cancer antigens and identify them like HER2. In addition to more investment in tech science, we need investment in technology. So much of what you've heard or heard in the past relates to metastatic cancer cells or cell lines and primary cells. But what we don't have for the most part is our tissues and cells derived from patients going from the very beginning, the primary tumor, to the actual spread or metastases to lung or bone. We need to understand how these cells, these initial primary tumor cells, become metastatic cells. And I believe we can only truly understand that by following the process in patients. Um, why we need technology here is we don't have easy ways to biopsy metastatic tissue. Uh, Liver, liver biopsies, bone biopsies, lung biopsies. They're generally not done in a cancer patient. They're assumed that they are metastases when they're viewed on an uh, X-ray or a CT. And the reason we don't biopsy them, it's still a significant procedure with risk. So if we can develop uh, technology that would easily let us sample them, uh, I believe we'll have a better understanding. Now, one potential advance in this area is the identification of circulating tumor cells, or CTCs. And these are cancer cells that have been observed in the cir circulation of most cancer patients. We don't know how their gene expression or their genomic alterations, to what extent they reflect the actual metastatic tumor, that remains to be proven. But it is potentially a way that we may be able to uh, identify similarities between cancer cells and uh, primary cells. Uh, our ability to detect micrometastatic disease, subclinical metastasis, I don't see any of my imaging friends in the audience, is terrible. Um, <laughs> we <t> <laughs> the, <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> same thing. Um, you know, we, we can only see metastatic disease when they're like a billion cells. So that's late in the game. If we could detect micrometastatic disease, we'd be able to predict the patient's outcome better, plus perhaps we'd have a better edge on treating the tumor, and actually probably as or more important, we need to develop new types of chemistry to develop new drugs uh, like people at UCSF, Jim Wells and Kayvon Chokat, for example, and physics for targeted drug delivery. We're still in the early stages there. And um, finally, echoing what, what other people have said, it, you know, it is rocket science, and you need a great team. I was pleased to hear that the B. subtilis scientists are a team with many uh, different talents. Well, uh, everyone talks about translation, there aren't really a lot of literal examples of scientists and clinicians working together. And I'll end there. Thank you, Mike. What do we mean when we say metastasis? I think most of us would mean disease that leads to symptoms and death, but it is a very tricky situation. If we have a very, very powerful way to image early metastasis, even to see 10 cells, how are we going to respond? Are we going to give patients additional therapy that goes beyond the, the, the surgery and frequently the adjuvant therapy and radiation that they got in the beginning? Uh, and how do we, are we going to evolve ways to control the subsequent growth of those, of those primary, uh, those primary uh, cells that have seeded and colonized some, some part of the, of the lung or the bone, but may never actually mature into, 
frank, clinically evident metastasis. Mark so I, I think there actually is information that's pertinent to that that is encouraging, and it comes again from the breast cancer field, where women who receive adjuvant therapy, um, women who are at risk for recurrence, women who receive adjuvant therapy have a lower rate of recurrence that suggest that that population of women have micrometastases and that adjuvant chemotherapy has, pr uh, has presumably killed those uh, micrometastatic cells. Two other members of the panel want to comment before we throw this open to the unpredictable general audience. Well, I think one thing that I haven't heard mentioned uh, with uh, regard to the metastasis is the uh, you know, the genomic changes that have occurred in most of the cancers. And so it's now evident for several cancers, particularly breast cancer, that there are signatures that are predictive as to whether a cancer will uh, progress or not. And so it's possible to have cells that have seeded all over, and they'll, they may give you mets when you reach 250 years of age, and that's not a problem. Uh, for yes. most of us, yeah. anyway, <laughs> yet. Uh, but you know, so I think that knowing that you have cells that have, uh, a, a particularly dormant cells that are in, in a tissue, isn't going to help unless you know whether th those cells have a probability of giving you a problem, uh, you know, in a normal uh, lifespan. And you know, otherwise we're we're over treating individuals. And you know, I th I think that. Preventing can, uh, metastasis is probably something we're not going to succeed at, but, but preventing death from metastasis uh, is a realistic uh, uh, goal because uh, perhaps we can prevent them from growing or figure out which ones will and which ones won't. Part of the reason we haven't had as much information as uh, we'd like about the difference in genotype between a primary tumor and metastasis is that we have not been, for obviously ethical reasons, sampling uh, tumors every time they appear in a patient who has severe disease, and we have not been as aggressive as we probably should be in getting samples at, 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 at autopsy. You know, autopsy has fallen mm -hmm. off even in a hospital like ours pretty dramatically, and uh, making a better effort to collect samples could be extremely useful. In the context of our own work at Sloan Kettering, we've there's been a major focus on lung cancer where there's a drug, uh, erlotinib, which has a, a very dramatic effect on patients who have EGF receptor mutations as a, cause, as a partial cause of their lung cancer. Those patients almost always uh, develop drug resistance within a year, but those patients are now almost always sampled for, uh, for uh, often at metastatic sites, uh, to determine the cause of resistance. And that is giving us a tremendous repertoire of samples from patients who had disease at metastatic sites, and I think we're going to learn a lot from that. Let's open this up for questions. We only have about another 15 minutes or so, maybe less, depending on how much we're willing to cut into the break or cut into the last session. So, Harold, let, me, let me just follow up on the last question you, you, uh, you mentioned and talk about resistance to chemotherapy. Is it known whether patients that present with metastatic disease, chemo-naive patients, are more resistant to chemotherapy than patients that present with a, with a, a single lesion? You want, maybe you guys want to take this. Uh, that, 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 it'd be very hard to answer that question as you put it. In the, in the, you know, often it's difficult to know what to look for as a marker of resistance if you haven't actually tried drugs. In the case of lung cancer, where there is um, a, 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 there are sets of <clears throat> well-defined mutations like the classical T790M mutation in EGFR. If you're, if you're from Genentech, you're familiar with that. Uh, you can do uh, next-gen sequencing and look for that mutation. Very uncommon to see it, but we know that cells with, the, with that mutation grow less well than cells without it. So in the absence of, of, of the selective pressure of using the drug, you're unlikely to see it, even though it may be present at very low levels. And it remains a controversy whether the mutation is actually present in the, in the cancer population. And there's no correlation that I know of as yet uh, with, between the presence of, of that resistance conferring mutation and metastasis. So I, I think the question is, um, well, we don't use chemotherapy alone to treat primary tumors. 
So if it's breast or colon or whatever, it's surgery and or radiation. So I don't think you can really, if I understand your question, about the sensitivity of those cells versus metastatic lesions. Yeah. Uh, Mark? You have a microphone down here? Uh, Mark's pretty loud, though. You can hear <laughs> 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 uh, no, I just wondered, uh, I just wondered if uh, the experiments you talked about, Harold, is very interesting about injecting norm, uh, essentially phenotypically normal cells into the body and having them actually go through a lot of the processes. But it raises the question as whether the rate limiting step is really the exit from the tumor. And to what extent, given what Zena said, maybe any of you can answer this question, is the inflammatory response an important part of re essentially recruiting cells? or allowing them to exit the tumor, in which case, um, since there are uh, uh, drugs around to treat various aspects of the inflammatory response, one could imagine that that would at least have some effect on the frequency of metastasis, and that could be, that could be tested at least in mice. So I wondered what you could say about that, any of you. Well, it's a double-edged sword, because there's considerable evidence that uh, inflammation may be uh, both a provoker of, of, of uh, cancerous behavior, cancerous phenotype, and a defender. Um, and uh, I agree entirely that, that the, trying to look at mouse models of cancer in which inflammation is a common property of the tumor could be very fruitful. And I, I think many people here will... will, will um, Zita might want to speak to this particularly because she's been... Yeah. Well, it, it turns out that modifying inflammatory cells, at least in, in models, uh, really does change metastatic rate, as suggesting that having those cells in the metastatic niche, uh, either before the tumor cells get there or with them, uh, does affect whether tumors uh, will grow uh, I think quite Mark's, significantly. Mark's also uh, referring to inflammation at the primary, in the primary. But, uh, but in terms of the primary, uh, the data from large population studies suggest that, that individuals who take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as a population have uh, nearly 50 percent less colon cancer and about 25 percent less breast cancer. The trouble is, I can't tell you if you take it, that'll change your rate. Well, Mark, there's a practical issue here, which is if you find a primary tumor in the absence of metastasis, you're going to take the primary mm -hmm. tumor out, which is a much more effective way to remove any inflammation at the primary site than any, any drug. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But certainly in the biology, the, the overall data, at least in most models, say that if you uh, tone down inflammation, particularly of the myeloid cells, you do reduce metastasis, and often primary uh, growth not at all. But the biology uh, is not tidy enough that you can link inflammation to one uh, step and one step only. Inflammation means uh, accrual of uh, all sorts of cells producing all sorts of cytokines, chemokines, including angiogenic ones, including different kinds of angiogenic ones. The vessels that you get there are not perfect uh, and beautiful. They are leaky, so you are increasing not only angiogenesis, but the byproduct of it, which is open doors, opening doors for escape. In addition, the circulating uh, release, the systemic release of these inflammatory cytokines may prep up distant sites. Uh, there's evidence that this happens with lung, uh, prepping it up that some of the circulating cells that enter there find the spots called premetastatic niche where they uh, reminisce about how it was back in the primary. So uh, there is a whole continuum of events in metastasis, all of which can have, and uh, we believe do have, uh, link uh, 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 to, to, to inflammatory cells and their mediators. I see Gordon Ringgold's hand here. Take back. Well, I don't know. I have the microphone. Oh, sorry, you have the microphone. The You've so, got power. Oh, Go I'll ahead. keep talking <laughs> until someone shuts me up. Um, this is a sorry, bit out say, of left field, but um, just I was struck by the, the malaria results and the sort of huge polymorphisms that you get in parasites for example, that sort of are living in a, a complex environment where presumably you want as many different variants as possible. And I'm kind of curious, has there, have there ever been any connections made between that sort of organism which needs to be as variable as possible, presumably to survive, and the changes that occur in cancer and metastasis? 
where you get, where it's sort of the same kind of evolutionary pressure. Well, we're, we're now, of course, experiencing an incredible deluge of data from the, from the uh, uh, Human Cancer Genome Atlas Project, which is showing us that the, but even when you, when you sequence whole genomes from, from cancers, that there may be as many as 50,000 changes, only some of which are drivers, but it's clear that, that uh, in a population of cancer cells, there are, there are many, many changes, and the opportunity for Darwinian selection is, is just as strong as has been predicted for a long time. And the real challenge now to cancer biologists is to take this genomic data and try to figure out what is actually significant with respect to diagnosis, new therapeutic choices, development of biomarkers, and the opportunities are great. The analogy I appreciate is, is very strong, but it's probably strong in any biological system in which there is inherent variability because mistakes are made during cell division, and there is a selective pressure, whether it's for plasmodium to grow in a, in a, in a host that's developing an immune response or influenza virus to, to grow under pandemic conditions. Uh, and these analogies are useful, but I think uh, to make real progress, you've got to study the thing you're trying to conquer. Gordon Ringgold. Is it on? Yeah. I, I wanted to follow up on, on Mark's question. The other aspect of inflammation... I don't think your microphone's on, so... Closer? Yeah. Mm. Uh, the other aspect of inflammation locally and, and egress of, of the cells um, into the vasculature is a component of capillary flow. And I was wondering whether there's actually increased or decreased capillary flow in primary tumors that stimulate metastatic egress and whether there are components, obviously there must be, that damage endothelium directly to increase vascular permeability. Well, there's a fair amount being developed, uh, information being developed about vascular permeability. And of course, <clears throat> vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, uh, was first discovered as vascular permeability factor. And so that is an issue that is, uh, or is a fact in both primary tumors and in, uh, in metastasis. The question of uh, what happens to the vasculature? Well, you know, angiogenesis in in, uh, in cancer gives you very abnormal and chaotic blood vessels, blood flows in different directions. It's not clear what it, what uh, whether a vessel is uh, aortic like or vascular uh, or, or um, venous like, and so which of those uh, might help? Uh, and uh, the process of uh, metastasis or not is not clear, uh, and it's, it's confused by a very important fact, and that is that when you start to interfere with blood vessels, or as occurs in tumors anyway, where you have these areas of hypoxia, that generates t uh, tumors uh, that have a much worse prognosis are much more metastatic, and you know those two processes are occurring in parallel. So trying to figure out, you know, whether doing uh, damaging or changing the blood flow in a capillary is important at a time when you're also changing the primary tumor is very, it makes it uh, very difficult to figure out which is important. I want to call on my rowing partner, Laura Van Veer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm following one's models very closely for the last years, and I like all your, the specificity of site of metastases, but I was also intrigued by Zena's comments on the body ecology. And so when patients present with metastatic disease, for instance, in breast cancer, they often present with metastases at multiple sites. So I was wondering, are all tumors capable of metastasizing at all sites, and will everybody accommodate all sites? So how do you interlink it? Well, again, the, 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 well, the fundamental concept is that a tumor is a heterogeneous genetically and phenotypically very heterogeneous population uh, of cells, the vast majority of which will be losers, will die. You know, metastasis is the term that we apply to the thing that grew in the end. So we see the result of evolution. Uh, the tumor doesn't set itself to program to place them here or there. It's just release. Uh, even in breast cancer, there are patients, depending on the subtype also, but even patient to patient, some who have bone disease for a long time, bone metastasis, and nothing else. Others where metastasis shows up first in, in, in lung, more readily first in brain. Uh, 
So there are several layers. First, uh, heterogeneity that uh, launches into the field uh, candidates. Then formidable barriers that will liquidate the vast majority of, of, of them. Third, cell of origin, or whatever else defines the subtype of tumor that has weight. And finally, individual, uh, poorly, if at all understood, determinants of, of, of wear. Uh, prostate cancer, the other extreme, is mostly, at least in the, in, for a long time, uh, in the disease of the patient, uh, metastatic disease, is bone. Does that mean that the prostate cancer cells released into the circulation don't pass through the lung? And of course they do. But the rate of attrition there is so high that we don't see, in that case, the probability of lung or, or brain metastasis. So, however, again, those 250 years, if we live long <laughs> enough, and it, these things would, would pop up. Well, certainly the issue uh, is both at the level of the tumor cell and the environment. And we've done some experiments where we've uh, changed the bone environment that makes it uh, particularly delicious for metastasis. And then we've injected, this is mouse models, injected the tumor cells uh, into, uh, into the tail vein. Normally, you only get lung metastases. But when you've changed the bone environment, the rare cell, obviously, that got through and got into the regular circulation and the bone, we're getting bone mets that grow up faster and earlier than the lung mets, which is what normally happens. So both sides are <clears throat> important, and which one is, import, is more important, in which case, is hard to tell. However, if we could identify what the, the environmental factors are, uh, again, those are not going to be subject to mutation to the same extent, so those may be more targetable. And I would also point out that if you, it, while it's attractive to try to separate the tropism from growth properties, it's very difficult to do that because these processes are at some level stochastic. So a cell that's selected or has the selective, selectable property of growing better is going to be present in larger numbers and have a slightly and higher chance of metastasizing anywhere. So this is complicated thing to try to analyze. We need people to do some mathematical modeling and systems analysis to try to sort this out. Mark, did you have your... Yeah, I, I was going to say about differences in cells that go to the bone or brain or lung, it's, it's a difficult problem because if you look for changes in gene expression between a lung metastasis and a bone metastasis, those changes may actually have been induced by the environment the cells are in. And I think probably a better way to do it would be to look for the genomic profile where presumably the environment isn't going to influence. I think it's a risk to infringe on the break excessively, but there's been somebody in the back with a hand up for quite a while, and we'll take that last, <laughs> the last question. So it's more a question on cell biology point of view. So we learned that these cells can be quiescence, right? So get out from the primary tumor and uh, invade like the metastatic uh, organ. How important are these cells that need to be quiescence? So in, some, in other words, I mean, what do we learn whether like when the cells that are right there, like uh, they change in expression by which uh, they, don't, they don't they have to go in the, in somehow in the cell cycle process because they need to survive and stick around for years in order to acquire like, other mutations or it's just a default mechanism. Or in other, like uh, in a more provocative way, if we induce in, uh, if, you know, to the cells in the, in, in, to proliferate, can we kill the cells because they are proliferating the wrong moment in the wrong uh, organs? Um. <laughs> <laughs> All are turning to everybody All else. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, so there's a lot of talk and a lot of wondering about the nature of the states of the, the, the disseminated cell population. Some would argue that they are cells in G0, so, and maybe they would become more vulnerable, as you, I think you implied, if they were kicked into cycle and then hit with... Uh, uh, others are saying, no, they, they are proliferating and dying at about the same rate. My own sense, and nobody has proof of anything, so I'll, I'll share with you my own sense, is that in a patient, who is carrying literally, literally millions of, of disseminated cells. There's probably cells for every imaginable state. Uh, and uh, we do not know, of course, which state is more like, uh, likely to, to progress. Furthermore, the cells that are in a given state today may be in the other state tomorrow. Uh, 
Um, by a states, I do not mean just proliferating or not, antigenically competent or not. We are now learning more and more about the reality that the so-called cancer stem cell phenotype is more a state than a preordained uh, stable phenotype. So when you're dealing with a, a whole population, then it's basically it's population science you have to do. You're going to have a whole repertoire in different sites, micrometastatic, and possibly metastasis may even emerge uh, in an organ being seeded by cells that have been micrometastatic for a long time in another organ. So all of this, which is imaginable, I'm afraid it's going to be real as well. Yeah. So a lot of work ahead. So I want to thank my colleagues for this, and I think we're all glad that Mike is back in the lab full time and can get to work on this problem, of, <laughs> this practical problem of metastasis.